Welcome to the Trailblazers Impact Podcast, a groundbreaking new podcast that explores the transformative journeys of contemporary female history makers, from the civil rights era in the 1960s to overcoming LGBTQ discrimination, gender bias, and racial discrimination in today's world. I'm Nan McKay, and Dee Dee Strum and I interview women and a few men to bring you the aspirational stories of fearless women entrepreneurs, authors, attorneys, executives, community leaders, and mothers who have blazed a trail for others to follow. Get your dose of can-do empowerment today. Trailblazers Impact Podcast is featured in the top 20 Trailblazers Trendsetters Podcast by Feedspot and is one of the top 28 podcasts for women in their 20s by Pretty Progressive. Visit our website, trailblazersimpact.com, and listen to all three of our podcasts. Subscribe using the link on our website to receive our newsletter with featured podcasts. Love what you hear? then please share our episodes on your social media sites and shop for all your Amazon needs through the link on our website, trailblazersimpact.com, to help support the podcast. I would like to introduce you to Tony Markey. Tony is currently the cruise director for Azamara Cruise Line, which is part of Royal Caribbean. But he has a very interesting background and one that I think you'd love to hear about. Qualifying for pharmacology before starring in the Song for Europe 83 for BBC, Tony trained at Sylvia Young Theatre School and was featured in many London shows, including Godspell and Rocky Horror. He's proud to have been the singing voice of My Little Pony. I think that sounds really interesting. (laughs) And is a diver, and he fenced varsity foil. Discovering law and teaching high school wasn't for him. And after a number 12 hit single in the UK gospel chart, he came back to sea where he was involved in the infamous Seaborne Pirate incident. We'll have to explore that. He has a CD, and it's available on iTunes and Spotify. So, welcome, Tony Markey. Thank you for being here. I like the fact you say currently, that's going to be fired next week. <laughs> currently the cruise director. <laughs> the reason I said currently is that it's the concept that you've talked about called the Grand Leap. We, we all have the ability to do a grand leap. I feel we all have the ability to do a grand leap and, and change direction. Who knows what your next grand leap will be? And that's Nobody. why I said currently. Nobody, <laughs> least of all me. We all, I guess, we're either product of our parents. Maybe you take over your parents' business or your parents were, your father was a lawyer. You become a lawyer or a doctor or you have a, an intellectual capacity, maybe you're good at science or good at history, and your parents say, oh, son, become a scientist, become a historian, whatever it may be. And you really, at your early years, you're 16 to 21, have almost no say in what your career path is. Very little say, really, because we're products of our parents. After that, you get stuck in this rut of being, I'm an attorney, I'm a doctor, I'm a shop worker, I'm a taxi driver. And you never think big. I never think, I still don't think big, but I do take the grand leap. When something comes your way, you all have the choice to say yes or no. And if you are a, a dissatisfied accountant, and I know, knew, know a dissatisfied accountant that went on a cruise with his wife, saw what the cruise director did, and he was a relatively successful accountant, went home and said, I'm going to be a cruise director. And he gave up accountancy and became a cruise director. I love that kind of thing. You have the chance to do anything you want in life. Anything. You just have to have the risk to take that grand leap into the inky void and hope that you're successful. And if you're not, take another leap. Find something you really want to do that makes your heart warm and makes you smile when you wake up.
So you certainly have an interesting philosophy and a, and a very good one, I think, especially for young people today that are trying to make up their mind, what do I really want to do with my life? Yeah, and we don't know it yet. We know that age. We no, know and nobody do. knows. Well, I shouldn't say it. A lot of people don't oh, know yes. exactly where they're going to end up. But let's talk about the beginning. I went to a, a relatively good all-boys school, quite a strict all-boys school in East London. And we didn't do the art at this school. It was a technical college. So we did science, maths, history, that kind of thing. But we didn't really do singing and dancing and drama. That was not what we did at school. And I realised probably age 12, I was good at two things, fencing and science. That was it. I had natural ability in science. So I went the science route at school. I graduated from high school at 18 with all my qualifications in science didn't really know what to do and thought, I'll be a scientist. So I talked my way in, and I really did talk my way in to a graduate job as a pharmacologist. I was 18, actually I was 18 and a half. And I managed to get a job as a research scientist under false pretenses. I never lied about anything, but I, my interview went so well that the professor and the doctors that were employing me in the, in the health service thought I could do the job. So they took me on, gave me a day a release every week, every day for four years to do my degree. They paid for one day, I paid for half a day. So a day and a half a week, every week for four years, I went to college and did my qualification, thinking I was going to become a scientist. I became a scientist, but I've always sung. Since I was the youngest possible memory, I've been a singer. Since I was five, my first professional job, I got paid half a crown, which is about eight cents, I guess, for doing, and my heavens, you can't even say this these days, for doing an Al Jolson impression. I must have been hideous at five years old, singing Mammy. And I just loved the whole idea of singing for a living. But you couldn't do that when I graduated high school. In the 70s, you couldn't pay a mortgage or have a family as a singer. It didn't exist. So I went the academic route, became a scientist, was going to go to medical school and become a heart surgeon. And, and then the grand, my first grand leap. It was the end of 1982. I received a phone call from a friend of mine who I'd sung with before that had a song accepted in the Song for Europe. Now, the Song for Europe is the competition that decides which song goes into the Eurovision Song Contest. The Eurovision Song Contest is all of the countries in Europe come together and sing one song each, they're voted upon, and the winner gets a big prize. And the winners include people like ABBA. Yeah, so ABBA won in 76, I did it in 83, and the thought is, if you win, that's you made for the rest of your life. You'll become a famous pop star. Of course, we lost, but beside the point. But once I'd taken that leap of faith to leave science behind and become a singer, that was all I wanted to do. I realised there was a career to be had in singing from 83 onwards. I never looked back. I just left all of that science. Actually, my parents were kind of bereft at the thought of their wonderful son giving up a career to become basically an unemployed singer and dancer. And I was unemployed for the next couple of years because I knew, didn't know what on earth I was doing. But I was just so determined to, to smile. As I said at the beginning, smile every day. You wake up and you smile because you're a singer and you've got the best job in the world, although you're unemployed. <laughs> but unemployment's not bad. I think that's wonderful yeah. that you're able to really do what your your passion Com was complete, at that point. Complete. I wasn't paid for it because I was unemployed. I was very fortunate. I applied for everything. I auditioned. I interviewed for any singing job. I eventually, in January of 85 found myself in the very north of England. I lived, I came from the south of England, in the very north of England for two weeks. One singing job for two weeks. And that I moved up on the Friday, and on the Sunday, I went for lunch at, at the girl I was singing with, the house she was living in, and met the lady that's now my wife. And I remember seeing Christine, my, now my lovely wife Christine, uh, on January the 9th, 1985, and saying to myself, that's the girl I'm gonna marry. And there was no doubt in my mind at all that was the girl. She could have been married with 10 children for all I knew, but I didn't know. I just saw her and knew that was it. 
she was a singer by pure coincidence and we then formed a career together we've been singing together since january 87 still singing together and that is a joy multiplied by joy it's to do what your passion is is something that you cannot comprehend if you have a regular job to get paid to do what you would do willingly do for free is quite something to do that with your wife or your loved one who also shares the same passion uh, there are no words to express how magnificent that is to do that and see the world now you fell in love at first sight it sounds oh, totally, like completely utterly uh did she yeah about that <laughs> <laughs> um well kind of in hindsight she said she we, we call it the hammer of thor she put her head around the door jam she was in the kitchen and she said hi and i got the hammer of thor to the head and it was instant my like you see in the tom and jerry cartoons with the stars rolling across your eyes it was absolute instant knew that was going to be the woman for the rest of my life she now says after a couple of days of chatting to each other she thought oh he's okay he's all right <laughs> but she had no romantic interest particularly then at all uh, and because i was brought up as a gentleman by my parents i never pursued anything i was a gentleman so every evening i would go across to her house and sit and i was driving so i didn't drink i was drinking tea or coffee and then we got to the door at three o'clock in the morning and We'd have that awkward moment where you're going, so, bye then, and goodbye then. And then I shook her hand. <laughs> For three months, I shook her hand. <laughs> so she thought I was definitely not interested. And then she told a friend, a mutual friend, that she was interested. And she asked me, and I said, well, I'm interested. She said, why don't you tell her? I said, well, that's not, not the gentlemanly thing to do. <laughs> Heavens above. So eventually I had to. So by April, I told Christina my intentions, and that was it. We were... As together. she said, and me too. And, and thankfully she said, yes, me too. By then she realised I wasn't some strange guy that just wore a white suit and tap shoes. So now you're both singers. Yes. And you then ended up getting married? Yes, we, we were together for seven years, singing, two years singing separately. Uh, and we never really saw each other. We were travelling the world separately. Christine had come off the QE2. She'd been on there for many years singing with the dance band. I didn't even know this existed. This whole world of cruise ships and singing it was an alien to me. I saw Christine's photos and thought, that's what I want to do. And then we got together as an act, a, a double act, the, the Steve Needy Gourmet of the cruise ships in January 87. January 88, uh, bizarrely, January the 9th, exactly the same day, we had our first ship, the Saga Fjord for Cunard, and that was it. I was absolutely hooked. Day one. My first ship, that was it. I wanted just to do that for the rest of my life. So what really was it that you, intrigued you? Know, you? Initially, before I did cruise ships, it was looking at Christine's photos. The QE2 is such an iconic ship, of course. But I saw the, the one photo that really intrigued me, it still does, I guess, because it doesn't happen now, was the QE2 being repainted in Hong Kong. And in those days, it was men on ropes with stretches of wood sitting on like seats and buckets with paint and a paintbrush you could not do that now with health and safety then you could this was about 1979 1980 and i just thought this is a world that i'm not aware of i want to go on a ship i want to see what it's like would i get seasick i have no idea so we did our first ship and our very first cruise was rio de janeiro to buenos aires through the straits of magellan to uh, Easter Island, which you'd heard about in books, but never going to go and see Easter Island, Pitcairn Island, where the bounty ended up, Mutiny of the Bounty people ended up, Tahiti and LA. And I'm this lad from a background in England that would never see this. And my first experience was seeing places that I just dreamt about when I was a kid. Easter Island, for goodness sake, and met Paul Heyerdahl. And that, for me, was the, the mom moment when I did my very first ship that you can actually do this for a living and you know, sustain a family and a house and things. And that was it. We came home very restless, wanting to go back again. It took about a year to get another ship. It was not easy in those days. There weren't so many of them. And that was it from that day to this, with a few glitches on the way of going home and doing other things. That's all I want to do. 
Christine, we worked together until eight, until 2008 on ships. 2008, when I came to Azamara, that's when Christine said, enough. I've travelled professionally enough. She now wants to enjoy kind of a, almost a retirement, but not quite. So she comes out as my wife and as a guest, not crew on board. She's just purely as a guest, but you can't keep an old hand down. So <laughs> every cruise, we still do our show together. And we just absolutely love doing it. And when we, I have to do it because it's my job, she doesn't. So when it stops being fun, she just won't do it anymore. But it's still fun. So did you ever decide to raise a family or was that not we, in the equation? Um, we had that discussion the first year. We, when we got together in 87, by 88, we realised that ships were a thing we wanted to do. Then we had to have that discussion. Do we want a family? Mm -hmm. Now, I've never, ever, 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 ever wanted children. My sister did. She has four. They're not children anymore, of course. It never featured in my being. Just no interest at all. Love my nieces and nephews. Don't want my own. But of course, I didn't know what Christine would feel. So I had to be honest and say, well, no, if that's the case, then OK, we're going to be together as a couple. We'll have a family and we'll find a different way to pay the bills. And she basically said, oh, no. Oh, no, I don't want children. Oh, goodness, no. And they said, if you do, I'm OK. And I went, well, I don't. <laughs> so, so thankfully, mutual we, we happened to find each other that neither of us wanted our own children. We just want nieces and nephews who you can spoil rotten. And, and they go home. And they go home <laughs> at the end. You fill them with sugar and ice cream and then send them home. Uh, so we do. That's what we do now. We spoil our nieces and nephews because we can. Bring them on board ships sometimes. Cruise with me before. Uh, but no kids around us. And then you can work away. You couldn't, I couldn't do this job and leave young children at home. Hard. It, for me, that would... that No. Family will be too important. It's hard enough leaving nieces and nephews and mother and sister, and, but not my own. No. So when you get to be a cruise director, and we'll talk about how you made that transition from singer to cruise director, mm -hmm. but when you get to be cruise director, are you then an employee or you're still under contract? Employee. It, it's an odd thing on ships. Almost 99.9% .9 of all cruise ship employees are not permanently employed. We are in, I'm, I'm permanently employed by Azamara on a rolling contract, on a four month contract. So I do four months on board and two months vacation. But my contract is, this contract currently is, is December 8th until April 5th. Legally and technically on April 5th, I'm unemployed for two months. So I go home for two months vacation, unemployed, technically. And then my next contract begins June 5th until October 6th. Now, I know that ahead of time. There's no way that isn't going to happen. But technically, for a whole bunch of reasons, cruise ship employees are contracted for their period on board. And then you go home on vacation, but you're technically unemployed. So I could work elsewhere if I wish to, which I don't. Uh, I could leave the company. In when I go on vacation, just decide to go and work somewhere else. There's nothing legally that would stop that. You're not permanently employed. But that is the industry. And that's actually kind of a good thing. Most of us engage with that. It does mean you're free to do anything you wish. I don't work in the UK. I can't work in the UK for the tax reasons. But if I wanted, if I did, I wouldn't want to. Two months vacation is precious after four months working hard. I'll bet it is. So with the hours you have to put in. Yeah, seven days a week. Yeah. 10 hours ish, 10 to 12 hours every day. And that's all crew on board, not just me. All crew do 10 hours, seven days a week. And we do it because we want to be here. We love doing what we do. So our two months vacation is friends and family time. We do a bit of traveling, but friends and family. So how does that work with employee benefits? Um, it, it kind of does and doesn't. On board, we have all the health benefits of working on here. So... You know, heavens forbid, if I had an accident in here... In two months. In my two months. Well, it's different for us. I've got health benefits at home because of my senior position on board. The regular crew, crew wouldn't necessarily have that. But on board, we're fully covered on board for health benefits. So if I fell and broken a wrist or a hand or a leg or anything, completely fully covered by the company. Uh, and they, they get... If you have to go home... They take care of all of that. They will get you home. They'll get your medical treatment at home. 
Um, so it's a very, very good system. Yeah, that's most, not all companies, sadly. But all Royal Caribbean companies, yes. So us, Royal Caribbean Celebrity, Pullman Tour, they're all covered by the same policies. And that's that really does mean a lot. It does. For, that means for many a, people. Yeah, it, it really yes. does. Are you assigned to a ship? Technically, I'm assigned to a company, so I only work okay. for Azamara. I wouldn't go and work for Royal or Celebrity. I only work as Azamara. So technically, they could send me to any of the three ships, Pursuit, Journey, or Quest. I've done all three ships. Since we launched this ship in October 1st, 2018, I'm assigned only to the Pursuit now. I was the takeout team. Me, Captain Carl, Hotel Director Richard, were the takeout team. Uh, and it's, it's family and it's home. It really feels like home to me. It isn't just a workplace, because it's our baby that we founded, we worked on in dry dock for five months. But the company could send me tomorrow to one of the other two ships. They probably wouldn't, but they could, technically. It's more important to you to have the family and the ship than where you end up going. Because, oh, completely. Yeah. I, I rarely get off the ship now. I've been around the world. I've been to 126 countries. I've been doing this 32 years and 13 days. <laughs> Honestly. See. And how many hours yeah. was that? <laughs> January the 9th. 1988 was my first ever cruise, uh, and I've been here ever since. So I've seen the world. I've been to almost everywhere you could possibly go on a ship, with one or two exceptions. So I still get excited, whether it's South America or Europe or Iceland or Africa or Israel, I still get very excited. I don't have that passion to rush off the ship at 10 o'clock in the morning. I go off for a walk, I have a cup of coffee somewhere, grab a sew-on patch to sew onto a jacket or a bag, but I've been most places. So I'm perfectly content to stay on board and it is there, therefore treated as home. And we truly do. We joke about this a lot. But for the senior management and most of the crew, it is family. I work with my assistant, the Captain Carl, for, I see them much, much, much more than I see any of my, my mother, my sister, my nieces, much more. Lee, my assistant, we live a few miles apart in Newcastle in the north of England. Uh, and we spend about seven months together a year, every day, seven days a week. I don't, sometimes don't see my wife that much. So it is truly his family. We have a, a special relationship on here. If it comes across to your passengers, it really does. Um, having been on many cruises, I, I've never felt the way I do about this one, where it does feel like everybody really really wants to do a good job Com completely and that they are totally focused on the passengers yes that starts at the top of them oh that starts absolutely with captain it does carl. captain carl smith is and hopefully never gets to hear this he is the singular most inspirational captain i've ever worked with so much for so many reasons in the old days you ran a bridge with fear when I started on ships, the captain was someone you didn't speak to. You never saw. If you did see him, it would be in the distance and you'd stand and salute. But you never spoke to him and he would never speak to you. That's far too beneath them. And he ruled the bridge with fear. Those days, thankfully, have long, long, long gone. And Captain Carl has the absolute trust of his bridge team. So when he does something on the bridge, they know absolutely he do the right thing to do. He always gives free advice to anyone and he knows the crew i've witnessed i've been with captain carl walking through the galley now the galley we all know executive chefs we know their names we know some of our chefs we know their head waiters nobody knows the name of the guy that peels the potatoes or washes the dishes nobody captain carl does not only that but he'll go and ask how june is and how's your wife and how are your two kids and well oh, you've got another one coming he knows that and he remembers it. And that for, I work with him every day. If you're one of the, the crew that works in the galley or down in the engine spaces uh, and the captain has the, the time to come and say to you, how's your wife? I hear, you know, your young child's got the flu or your second oldest just started school. That means an enormous amount to crew. And he's not doing it because he has to, because he really cares. And he's a really fine captain. Yeah. And we're not just talking about one or two employees. How many Four, totally? 408 typically on here. 
captain spent 10 years on the quest, our sister ship, with 408 crew, came to the pursuit with 408 crew, and he knows every one of them. That is it's, amazing. It's incredible. And that, that's a mark of a man. Even I don't know that many crew on board. I know them all, but we don't know their names and their families. Captain does. That's Azamara amazing. It is. It's as amazing. <laughs> because that's what we can do. Because it is family. But we, have, we take the time to do it. When we have time off, we don't just go and lock ourselves in the room. You'll see Captain, all of us, around all the time. That's what we do on Azamara. And I've worked on a whole bunch of ships that, no, it doesn't happen. It isn't for everyone. This, this kind of ship atmosphere isn't everyone's cup of tea, of course. That's absolutely fine. There are more than enough ships out there for everyone. Yeah. Well, and it's a management style mm -hmm. that either yes. <clears throat> the person does it naturally or they don't. Yes, that's also true. Yeah. But I think the ones that are most probably successful mm -hmm. are the ones that have that family atmosphere or at least have the, the loyalty, the camaraderie, the buy-in. The, the loyalty. We all do. I do my training every every cruise. I do training with my managers, with my crew. And no one wants to sit through me talking for half an hour about safety training. You make it fun. and uh, I was a school teacher, which helps. But you make it fun and engaging. So you do things like, what is a banana? And how does that relate to being a crew member? And my crew look at me like I'm an idiot. I mean, what is a banana? when they engage with what is a banana, and very few people ever get this right. What is a banana? I'm Most, sitting here they, wondering. What would, you, what would you say a banana is? Apart from being yellow. Almost everyone says it's a fruit. Yes, I was it, going to say is, that, but I thought I know that's not the not. right answer. <laughs> it's a herb. It's a five-sided oh. herb, I know. Now it's that I would herb. never have gotten. It's a herb. Um, scientifically speaking, it's a, a, an herb. It's a herb with five sides, which is fine, but how does that relate to good management? So instantly, you've then got the attention of your crew, because you're not saying, okay, good management is doing this, or no, you're saying, what's a banana? And you wait, and you ask, people say, oh, it's a fruit, no, it isn't. Uh, it's a vegetable, no, it isn't. And eventually, you get to the point, it's a herb. If you know what something is, if you know who someone is, uh, you can then interact with them appropriately because all everyone's different. So I will talk to you in a completely different way than I talk to the captain. I will talk to one of my dancers. I will talk to um, a country president or prime minister of somewhere. You need to know who you're talking to to be able to assess how to appropriately interact with them. And unless you know that person, how do you do your job efficiently and make your job so much easier knowing who you're talking to and being appropriate? What's a banana? If you know it's a herb, then you're halfway there. So by doing training like that, and we all do this kind of weirdness, it engages your crew to, to be, want to learn stuff, to what willing to, to take in all this, be a sponge. Fascinating. Well, it works, and that's the important part. <laughs> it works. We all do it. And Captain Carl is the, the master of this. Some of the things he comes out with make you, your eyes spin, but it's always a point. Yeah. Well, I think the passengers really appreciate how candid he is. Totally. Even on the microphone, yep. he's very candid. Be honest. And he's, it just sounds like he'd be a, a fun, engaging, interesting person oh, to work with. Oh, he is. And just to talk to. You have to be honest on here. It's a ship, so things happen. Our toilets might break down, or we miss a port. or There's no point either not saying something or trying to lie your way through it. The truth's going to out. So at some stage, the truth will out. And if we miss the Falkland Islands, which is about 50-50 chance every time of getting there because of the weather, you have to be honest and say there is an, you know, 62 knot wind and there's 18 meter waves. And don't just try and wing it and say, well, we tried our best. No, just, and Captain, just, we all are, just be honest. It saves all that trying to remember what the lie was as well, because yeah. I've got a dreadful memory. <laughs> yeah, I'd never true. be able to do it. <laughs> I assume you a uh, qualification is that you can't get seasick either. Many people on ship get seasick. I couldn't do, do the really? job. I, I've been through hideous seas over the years, never, ever once been seasick. But there are a couple of my, one of my other assistants, terribly seasick. Almost live on Dramamine um, or something. And actually, that's difficult, because Dramamine, of course, makes you tired. It yeah. makes you woozy. It dries you up. So if you're a singer... With a dry mouth, that isn't good. 
So often you just have to work your way through it. Where the, the uh, wristbands apparently work very well, have acupuncture, eat ginger. I, I don't know, I don't get seasick. So. <laughs> well, but the captain had got seasick once on a Danish ship, so it happens. Wow. So let's talk about how you got from singer to cruise director. One of our very first ships, Christine and I, way back in the early 90s, we were coming to Grand Cayman. I'd never been there before. I'd read lots of Dick Francis novels. I'd met Dick Francis, a very famous British author. Uh, he lived in Grand Cayman. I was kind of excited to the thought of meeting him again, just walking down the street. And we'd heard how beautiful Grand Cayman was. And the dancers that were on board said, oh, Grand Cayman again. Oh. And Chris and I were that evening having a glass of wine and we said, you know, if ever we get like that, it's time to go home. If ever this stops being magnificent and becomes blasé, go home. And we did it for many years and we got to 1996. We'd done a couple of world cruises, working on P&O, just finished the first year on the brand new ship on Oriana. And we found ourselves going to somewhere like St. Vincent Grenadines or Barbados, a quite exotic part of the world, or Aruba maybe. And we were going to go off, and we went, oh, Aruba again. Oh, we'll just stay on board. And then we both laughed, and we went, you know, <laughs> time to go home. We'd, we'd done ships. We'd seen everywhere, been everything. We got bored. We were guest entertainers then. A guest entertainer works 45 minutes a week. And we were on board ships sometimes for six, eight, nine months on the same ship. Because the guests change every week, doing 45 minutes a week. So boredom is, is easy in those days. So we went home. We went home. I uh, retrained. I went to law school. I thought that was going to be... I was a justice of the peace. I became a JP, then decided to go to law school. That wasn't for me. I did my first year, loved law, but I couldn't see myself practising, ultimately. What's the point? I had a chat with my law professor. And I said, I'd actually quite like to teach law. But you then have to do the law degree and become a an attorney first, and he said, well, your background was in science, teach science. And with a, a, a hesitation of a second, I went, okay then. He called a friend at another university, just south where I live in Sunderland. That was Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, I drove across to Sunderland, met the head of physics. He put a block of wood on the table and said, tell me all the forces acting on that wood. Now I was then 30, 38, maybe 39. I hadn't done science since I was 18. I hadn't studied science. I graduated when I was 21 uh, from you know, university, so I hadn't done any science. I was, um, well, there's, a, whew, there's, um, there's gravity and um, some other stuff. And I had no idea. And there about 13 forces. I just couldn't think of it. But bizarrely, he said, OK, you're in. I get, saw something in me, I don't know what. So I did a two-year conversion degree to become a science, a high school science teacher. And I thought I would love it. I really thought I'd found my calling. So I graduated that in 2000, went to teaching at the end of 2000, September 2000. The downside is we had no children and I left school at 18. So I hadn't been in a school since I was 18 in 1978. And I really, really, truly thought schools would be like they were when I left. It's like waking up, Snow White waking up after 21 years and expecting the world to be the same or Captain America. It moved on a lot, incredibly a lot in those intervening years. And the first school I went to was a private school, a Catholic private school, 14 pupils in a class. I thought, this is great. I've got it made. But all the pupils were relatively, well, they actually were all very privileged children, very wealthy parents. They're obviously all going into mummy or daddy's businesses. And I wanted to make a difference. So I did that for a while. And no, no, I'm going to leave and go to an inner city school because I want to make a difference. And then met real life. And I have untold, untold compassion for teachers and the respect is immeasurable for teachers that do what they do. It is one of the hardest jobs you could possibly imagine doing, to teach and inspire. I was teaching 11 to 18, and there honestly was not a day went by that I enjoyed. I hated 
every single second of every single day. I was not an effective teacher. I didn't engage with what kids did. I, they'd moved on, I hadn't from 78. And that was my mistake, a big mistake. I did it for a couple of years, was not happy. And I was sitting, Wednesday, it must have always happens on a Wednesday. I was Wednesday lunchtime sitting in the staff room, having lunch and marking biology books. I was teaching biology, chemistry, and physics. Uh, and year nine, so 13 year old biology books, and just thinking, oh gosh, I, I can't, this was May, I can't do this for another 25 years. And a producer I used to work with called me on my cell phone. And she said, oh, hi, Tony, it's Lee here. I went, oh, hello. <laughs> you know, it was all the teachers. And she went, oh, can you talk? Yes. Then she said, are you busy? Are you doing anything at the minute? And I thought for a second, I went, no. Why? And she said, well, I'm doing a tour, a national tour, a song called, a show called Swing Into Salsa. We want you in it. If you want it, it's yours. And I looked around the, the staff room at all these just miserable, poor, stressed out teachers that none of them were smiling. And I remembered when I used to smile as a singer. And I went, um, okay then. Um, yeah, great. And I was a salary job with a pension and everything. When is it? She said, well, this was Wednesday. She said, we, we rehearse on Friday, first rehearsal. And the first half is all swing music, which you know. The second half is all salsa. And can you salsa? Now, I hadn't danced for five years, and I put on probably, I don't know, 30, 40 pounds. I have no idea. And I went, yeah, well, of course I can salsa. <laughs> what? Salsa master? <laughs> and I was, what was I thinking? And I was vastly overweight, vastly unhealthy, hadn't danced for years, could barely walk, let alone salsa. She said, okay, great, I'll see you on Friday. I went, okay, when do we open the show? She said, well, there's been a cancellation at the Gravesend, Auto Theatre Gravesend, outside London, on Monday. And I swallowed and went, Monday, like three days after Friday. She said, yeah, you'll be fine, but you know, it's be fine, you can start, so you know the songs. Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> Put the phone down, and I had a panic attack because I thought, well, I've just told Lee I'm going to do this show. Not because I was giving up teaching. I've got to tell my wife. I've got to tell Christine, who kept me for two years when I was studying. I didn't work for two years because I was studying so hard. Uh, and I went straight down, got all, my <laughs> got all my books together. I can't believe I even did it now. I would never do it these days. Went straight down to see the deputy head teacher, the superintendent of the school, and said, uh, hi, Mr. Chibben. Um, it's just not working for me. I'm sorry, I've tried my best, but I'm not happy. And I was a popular teacher because we always giggled in my class. It was always fun classes, but didn't learn anything. And Alan, Mr. Chippen said, uh, oh, the, the pupils will be disappointed in September when they come back. I said, well, not really September. And we had a thing called half term before the exams. He went, half term? I went, no, 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 not half term. And he said, when are you leaving? And I put my books on his desk and handed him my school pass and my ID and went, Bye, and turned, and he was, I remember him shouting at me as I left, you can't do this, you'll never work again. And I just ignored him and kept walking. I was shaking, shaking with terror. Got in the car and started to drive home and again had another panic attack and had to stop on the road and think, I, I've got to go home and tell Christine. I've given up a job and a pension to do a show that I can't do because I can't salsa dance and I'm 30 pounds overweight. I've so I called Christine and said, uh, hello, darling. And God bless her. She's long suffering. She said, you've given up teaching, haven't you? And you could have knocked me down with a feather. I went, how can you possibly know that? Impossible. And Leah, the producer, had lost my number, called Christine. And Christine had given her my number and knew, instantly knew that I wasn't going back. So I called my friend that was a dance teacher. And all evening Wednesday, all day Thursday, all night Thursday, and all morning Friday, we had salsa lessons. And I went into the rehearsal knowing how to salsa. Amazing. I, now, what I really want to know is, did you lose the 30 pounds by Monday? Well, I walked in. <laughs> I didn't know, but the second half, the salsa half, was in a, light, a spandex catsuit. <laughs> I, I know, it gets worse. I know. I've got photos somewhere. And I walked in and Leah took a big breath in. She's a tiny woman, went, I won't say what she said, but it was a few expletives. And then she said, what have you done to yourself? 
I hadn't seen him for th three years. I says, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll manage. And your salsa dancing going... <laughs> <laughs> but I got through it, and within, I, well, I don't know, two months maybe, I dropped 30 pounds, maybe less, maybe a month and a half. I just, I started eating properly, I exercised, I was dancing every day, salsa up and down the country. So I dropped all of that weight and lost so much more, got really toned, really. Uh, and then that tour ended, and purely, again, the grand, grand, back to the beginning, the grand leap. And I knew I was giving up, I'd given up teaching. And that was an absolute. I didn't know what I was going to do, because these shows last for a month or two, and that's it. So by August, I'm unemployed again. You can always sing, that isn't a problem, but I want a regular income. And she, Leah, had offered me some bits and pieces here and there, and I was just working hand to mouth almost. And my ex-agent called me and she said, oh, are you available for an interview? And I went, oh, for what? And said, well, Seaborn, who I used to work with in the early 90s, they want a cruise director. And your name came up. Are you interested? This was 2005. I went, oh, no, 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 no. I know what cruise directors do. I've been a guest entertainer doing 45 minutes a week. No. She said, well, Mr. Rapp, who was then the boss, he... Your name came up and he really wants to talk to you. I'm sorry, not interested. Called me back again and said, well, I've spoken to Mr. Rapp and he really does want to speak to you. So, okay, I'll come down to London and we'll do it face to face. So the next morning, I got the, the bus, like the Greyhound bus down to London where I live, a five hour journey, and had the interview and was talked into it. And I said I would do it for two months. A friend of mine had been on board for seven months as cruise director, Trevor Stevenson. He lived in Montserrat. He just had to get home after seven months. I said, OK, I'll do two months just helping you out. But that's it. Then back to my normal life. Christine was going to be at home. It was the, the only time since we'd met we'd been apart. We'd been together every single day, all day, every day, working together, living together. So I flew to Dubai, joined the ship. Really didn't intend to stay. And about five days later, I called Christine. And she said, as only a woman can, she said, you're staying, aren't you? And I did seven months on board. And I just found a square peg in a square hole. The job was just right. I don't even know why. I still don't know why. To this day, all those years later, I have no idea why it suits me. But it does. Complete square peg in a big square hole. And been doing it ever since. And God bless the people that believed I could do it, because I didn't. I had no idea what I was doing. None. And the man training me, Trevor, the day I got on board for 10 days handover with him to teach me the job, got a big dysentery and was confined for 10 days. So I was put in front of a computer with a big department and said, there you are, do it, go. And I had really no concept of how this side of the business ran because I was an entertainer. It's like being a shop worker and being told suddenly you're managing you know, the, the store. You, you can't. But I don't know. I did. I had lots of support from everyone, thankfully. And I'm still kicking my eye, as they say. Well, it's a grand example of the grand The grand leap. leap. You take that leap. I could have said no. I could, even at the interview, I could have said no. And I didn't. I gave up Seaborn in 2008, went home. Leah, again, the same lady, called me. Do you want us to do a national tour of Annie Get Your Gun? And I wanted time off ships. I, Seaborn was not pleasant the last couple of months there. It was a, a tough, very, very tough job. I resigned, came home, wanted six months at home. A month later, I decided to go and do this tour with Leah. The very first day of rehearsal, day one, Monday, I got a phone call from a lady, Rebecca Thompson Foley. She, she spoke like, hello, hello, love, it's uh, Rebecca here. I went, oh, hello. She said, um, we've got your name. We understand you're a cruise director and you're available. Yes and no. Cruise director, but not available. Um, she said, we have a, a company called Azamara uh, that need a cruise director. I'm sorry, I'm not interested. And it was horrible. It was October. Horrible weather at home in Newcastle. Rain and cold. She said, well, you come very highly recommended and we'd like to interview you. I went, honestly, February. I'm not available. I've just signed a contract for national tour. Not available. She said, then said, well, of course, we'd have to fly you to Miami. And I went, I'm not, ooh. <laughs> Miami, when? She said, well, we fly you on Friday. Interview, all day Friday's yours. 
Saturday morning we interview you. All day Saturday's yours. We fly you back Sunday afternoon. Uh, Miami. Is it warm there at the minute? Oh, this is, is it October, so it's lovely. Okay, I'll come. But I did, I was honest enough to say to her, if I get the job, I can't start until February. I absolutely can't, but I don't want the job. I need time off ships. I need to get my my life back in order. Um, I did the interview, which was a complete farce, the interview. And at the end, I said yes. I took that, that leap again, another grand leap, and I'm still here, 11 and a half years later. And did you wait till February? Still, nope. That was the kicker. This was Saturday. And eventually, after lots of good dueling, I said, OK, I really like the sound of this. A new company. I like the sound of this new company, Asamara. It sounds exactly what I would like to do, but not till February. And she said, no, we need you on Wednesday. I said, oh, impossible. She said, no, we need you on Wednesday. You're the right person. You've got the job. You leave on Wednesday. Uh, and I said, oh. I have to talk to my wife. She said, nope, we need an answer now. We've got two more people to interview. If you want it, it's yours. If not, then we interview others. And I sat for three seconds and went, okay. Took that grand leap, had to sign the forms, called Christine, guess what? You've taken the job, haven't you? <laughs> she's a, just, I think she's a witch somewhere, to, to a coffin <laughs> somewhere. But she knows me more than I know myself. And I've been... Ex really ecstatic since day one. It was hard. Day one was was a tough first year at Samara. But it's just where you want to be, really. And it all comes down to you started saying the grand leap. Everything I've done, I've never auditioned and got a job, ever. All the auditioning I did in London, I got nothing. I only got the job in Newcastle because I could dance. And men in Newcastle then didn't dance. They could sing but not dance. So I was the only one that had a pair of tap shoes. So I got the job. But that's it. And anything else that just come my way, someone calls you, a friend of a friend of a friend, and you have the chance. Everyone, everyone in the world has the chance to say, yes, I'm a taxi driver, but I really want to be. And there's one of our guests, one of our guests uh, who wants to, wanted to be, bizarrely, a nuclear physicist. And he is not a nuclear physicist. He is as far away from that as you and I are. And he said, I'm going to apply to do a physics degree. Now, having taught physics, I said to him, that's, that's a very tough thing. That's real intense high mathematics. That is not an easy thing to do. And it's all applied maths. I'm going to do it. And God bless him. He applied, got accepted to pass his first year. And he just said yesterday, he got 73% on his physics exam for this year because he absolutely believed in himself, completely did, where everyone else said, mm, you can't do that. But he took the lead. That's amazing. I think the other thing that you said that's really important to young people today, or really <clears throat> anybody who's embarking on a new career in kind of uncharted waters, is your first year was tough, Oh, but you stayed, stayed. with yeah. it. Uh, and if they... I have faith that I can do it. I've got every right to go back and try. So I came back my second contract, which was easier. My third was easier again. My fourth was that bit easier. And by 2010, when Mr. Pimentel took over, we had a direction, we had a, a mission statement, we had a vision, and I'm still here. I don't want to generalise young people because it isn't necessarily true, but many young people feel empowered to have everything they want now. And it is that generation. You watch things like American Idol and The Voice. They want fame now. I've done lots of TV, lots of radio, recordings, had records, had the, the hit in the charts. You work hard for those. They don't come to you. You don't write to have them. You have to work hard to sustain it. Anyone can have a number one hit once. It's sustaining a career from that number one hit that gives you the longevity and allows you to have a house and pay a mortgage. Many young people don't want to work hard like you and I would have to do to get what you got and to get where I am. You have to work hard. There's no shortcut for that. Talent isn't enough and mummy and daddy aren't enough. You work hard. Yeah. And eventually that will probably sink in. Eventually. Well, it, people, has to. But it, it, it has to. It has to. I think it, you yeah. know, it's a lot of what happens with the 
the Gen Y and the Gen Z, but you know, yeah. they'll find. You have to, and my lovely everybody. niece Rebecca found it. She graduated undergraduate degree, got her bachelor's in art, and so we're gonna conquer the world and have a nice big house and a huge garden and dogs and marriage. And, and then you realize actually the first couple of jobs don't pay so well, slightly above minimum wage. And she wasn't prepared to work hard and she had to. And Uncle Tony told her that. And she trusts Uncle Tony to tell her the truth, which I always do. And we convinced her to go back and do a master's in law, which she did. Uh, got a very good master's in law. And now she has a very, very good job. And a big house. And a nice salary. <laughs> and getting a nice house and getting married and having all of that. And then she's got her first dog. And all of that's coming because she had to work hard. And you have to find that for yourself. Yeah. No one can tell you because you don't believe them when you're youthful. I think that's true. Yeah. I didn't. Well, I have one more very important question mm -hmm. to I'm ask. A couple of really important questions. How did you become the singing voice from My Little Pony? <laughs> you know, that it's been it's been a blessing and a curse in so many ways over the years. I met two wonderful young ladies on a ship, oh heavens, twenty five years ago, and they were both. One was a, a lieutenant, one was a major in the Israeli army. And they showed me photos of their offices back in Tel Aviv. And it was, there, were, there were handguns and rifles and grenades and all this. And a string of My Little Ponies on their desk amongst all this weaponry. And they were besotted with My Little Pony. It's the world's, was and is, the world's best-selling toy. So I moved up to Newcastle. My agent at the time, which was in just that side of Newcastle, called me. I'd only been there maybe a month, if that. Because I could read music and I can see music and sing what it is, you don't have to learn a song. If I have the music written, I can just sing it. I used to do session singing where you do background vocals for big artists. You're paid by the hour, so you have to be able to read music to get as much as you can. And he said, I've got this toy, this company called Hasbro have come up with this toy they want someone to do the singing voice for it. There's, I don't know how many songs, six, seven songs or something. And you work for us, so you can read music. Do you want to do it? I went into the studio the next morning, and it was £50 session fee, or half of 1%. And I went, no. And it was those days, it was a brown plastic horse with pink hair. No joints, didn't do anything, didn't... It just, it was a hunk of plastic. And I thought, who's going to buy a hunk of plastic with pink hair? Give me the fifty pounds. Mm. I know. Oh, Where were you <laughs> in nineteen eighty-five? Um, and they gave me these. And actually, even now, I I can't sometimes get the, the songs out and have a listen. They're really good songs. Really good songs. Bowtie, Lickety Splits. Oh, heavens above! Who else were there? there? Was loads of them. Loads of songs. And you had to do different voices. Each song had a character voice. And the producer said, I want this one to sound like, I can't remember the guy's name, but the old cowboy that was in all the old cowboy movies. Gene Autry? No, no, the old, really old man. Really old. Really old man that was always the, the old drunk at the bar. Oh. <laughs> and he kind of spoke like that the whole time. He wanted that kind of voice to sing. I, okay, so I did that voice. I did the, the pop voice with the big vibrato, all these different voices for the character ponies and thought no more about it and it, I got paid and I went out that evening took Kristen out for a meal and spent the £50 instantly uh, and thought no more about it until maybe six months later when it was released and that was a prototype of the pony of course and then the full one came out with all the jointed limbs and the funny hair and everyone had a different name and then the single the, the songs were released and yeah and I've met I, countless hundreds upon hundreds of guests Either they played with them or their daughters or granddaughters or everyone knows my little pony. So occasionally, maybe the moral to that story is the grand leap <laughs> may not actually get you where you want to yeah, be. Yeah, I should have probably read the contract a bit closer before I took that grand leap. What's the name of your fun. CD? The one currently is An Amazing Journey. Okay. I think that's the one on iTunes and Spotify. I think it's a amazing journey i've got several cds only one of them are on spotify it's on amazon itunes but tony markey there's only one tony markey actually no it isn't it's called i'd rather be sailing that's what it's called All right. i'd rather be sailing so we will put it on our shop page 
other website, sailing. and then mm -hmm. you, people what's can bizarre, buy it right from there. What's most bizarre, and because of what we do, we don't involve in big business. When you you submit your album, you get all these licenses which cost an absolute fortune. You submit your album to, for sale on Amazon and iTunes. They assess it and they price it. You've got absolutely no say at all. And I said, foolish, I said, oh, $20 for it. And Amazon wrote back and went, ha, 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 that's very funny, no. And they charged like $5.86 or some ridiculous amount. iTunes came back and said, no, we we're going to charge $7.00. Four cents or some some arbitrary amount. I don't even know how they do it. But the, this is everything. This is books, goods, anything Amazon or any of those by they they set the price point. Spotify has been a that's fantastic. What a great system Spotify is. And you you get to pay a subscription a month and you download, you can stream whatever you want. But the artists still get paid. It's like 0.4 percent per play. But there is something, and if you're Ed Sheeran that's getting millions of plays, that can be a substantial amount of money that you're making for Spotify. That's so good a whole to know. new world. So I'd rather be saving. It's a great song from a show called A New Brain. No one knows the song, no one knows the show. But it says exactly what our lives are. Food is good. I'd rather be saving. Life is nice. I'd rather be saving. And that's so true. And Nothing that's what it. you do. Nothing does it. Nothing makes you smile every day quite like sailing. Yeah. Well, thank you so oh, much, pleasure. Tony. Thank it's you. just been great to talk to you. Awesome. And thanks for sharing oh, everything that pleasure. you did. It's a heck of a life. <laughs> One day I'll write a book. Thanks for joining us. We hope you're inspired to tell everyone about our podcasts. Support our podcasts by subscribing and shopping on our website, trailblazersimpact.com. And remember... You must learn a new way to think before you can master a new way to be.